Genetic mutations within the human race are something that is very clearly going to persist because the longer that we are here, the more adaptations are going to arise within our species to deal with the parameters of living on a semi-volatile rock. In some ways, these mutations can be beneficial. Take the Delta 32 allele mutation, for instance. When the plague was big and running amok on the planet, this specific mutation would arise within the genome of Central Europeans and become a defining trait of the population as they were able to survive Yersinia pestis. This mutation led to the co-receptor on the cell surface to form either partially in or completely submerged underneath the cell membrane. We would later learn that the chemokine receptor 5 or CCR5 would be the receptor that HIV would bind to in order to be brought into cells. With this receptor existing below the surface, HIV could not enter the cell, making the individual functionally immune or highly resistant to an HIV infection. Although it should be noted, HIV still has a propensity to target other receptors as well, so it seems like it also adapts, but other mutations are not so great. For instance, any mutation to the p51 gene can result in cancers spreading rapidly through the body due to the lack of tumor suppression. Other mutations are sort of a mixed bag, helpful in one way, horrible in others. The point mutation on hemoglobin beta gene on chromosome 11p15.5, for instance, results in sickle cell, which can cause sickle cell anemia. This could be great concerning like operating in the face of parasitic infections such as malaria and can lead to problems such as anemia, extremity pain, blood clots, and a multitude of other unpleasant experiences with daily function. It's safe to say though, genetic mutations while possessing the ability to be beneficial can be quite harmful as it's taking something that works and altering it to give it the chance at performing better, but also giving it an equal chance that it may actually make you less fit for the environment. One notable mutation is concerning today's topic that functionally makes a person immortal, but this comes at the cost of another. In the events of spring, a woman has a rather interesting ability that has allowed her to survive over the last 2,000 years. Originally an inhabitant of Pompeii, this genetic ability was passed down to her. Every 20 years, she will take on a new form, having her cells completely renewed, but in the events leading up to this, she has the ability to tap into ancient forms of DNA that turned her into a monster, potentially making her quite dangerous. So in today's episode, let's discuss the genome renewal that she is able to utilize, how this could be possible, how it makes her biologically immortal, and what science is there behind her transforming into the creatures that she does. But before getting started, as always, I want to thank you guys for watching. Without you, I am totally boned. If you enjoy this content, then please feel free to leave a like as it gets the video out there. And come join my Discord where we watch movies together that then end up on this channel. And also, come check out my gaming channel, like right now. Well, actually, after you get done watching this, it's called Roanoke Games. It's starting to catch traction, which is pretty dope. So thank you for the support over there as well. But wrapping up this i have new merch hey guys so my new merchandise is finally launching for halloween like this shirt right here which is pretty sweet and a coffee mug of course and then also this shirt wow would you look at that amazing also it's me squatting with a coffee cup and a shirt and then that is professor Furface, and i have hoodies so if you would like to support the channel check out roanokemerch.com so we kick off our story with a dude named Evan. He's in his mother's room taking care of her. His mom then tells him a joke about the shopkeeper and then after telling it, she's not looking really that great as her eyes dilate out and that's all she wrote on that. Well, that was mega depressing. Jumping over to a bar, Evan, Mike the bartender, and his friend Tommy are having a drink. They had a small funeral for his mother to which Tommy ended up dropping like Evan's mom's casket because fish oil was on his hands. Like, why this man had fish oil on his hands is beyond me. It is never explained. Well, one of the background is freaking out about the cigarette machine not working, which Garrett is short for cigarette, by the way. Evan gets up to go to the bathroom, running into Mr. Flat Bill Hat over here. Like, sweet snapback, brother. Serious question, though. Who is repping South Dakota? There's like four people that live there. And I should know. I've driven through there at 2 a.m. on I-90 and was the only car in the pitch black the whole time. Definitely an eerie experience. So the guy immediately realizes he's packing all 2.3 inches and gets upset about it and then accuses Evan of going after his woman because he happened to be walking the same way as Crystal Methany. Evan then tries to calm the situation down as Tommy says shut up and just come have a drink with me. In doing so, however, Snapback grabs a beer bottle and intends to smash it on Tommy's head as Evan absolutely just handles the dude. Drinking out back, Mike comes out and says he's not fired, but the boss says he can't work there anymore. Brother, what? Mike then tells Evan he needs to change up his environment. Which is super apropos, as unfortunately, who would have guessed? Snapback turns out to be the sort of guy that starts a bar fight, then presses charges because he lost. Like, look, just take the L as a man and stop starting bar fights. They're stupid anyhow. Heading home, Tommy and Evan then drink on the front porch. Evan talks about leaving as Snapback shows up saying he knows where he lives now. Evan is concerned the cops are going to get involved as Tommy says, well, I can stay if you need me to. And 
But the only problem is, is that the only bed available is Evan's mother's deathbed, as Tommy says he's not drunk enough for that. Tommy tells him, ah, just lock the doors and I'll see you tomorrow. Evan then calls up one of his old flings and, I can't show any of this. She then asks how he feels about her, which he's clearly not that interested, so she says, nah. He then passes out and wakes back up to the knocking on the door. It is the cops. Looking over at his passport, he gathers, yeah, I probably need to get out of the country for a little bit. Grabbing a taxi, he starts calling around to get a flight. He starts asking, do people go to Canada or, I don't know, South America, maybe Humansville, Missouri? But then he jumps on the first plane to Italy because white people love Italy, according to him. And as he is on that plane, he's working on a hardcore buzz. Successfully dodging the cops, he begins his walking tour around Italy and getting random pictures. He then heads to a hostel for the evening and then running into the British, he joins Tom and Sam for a drink as these two are on vacation as Evan goes to make a pass at an Italian woman, which he totally blows. Uh, evidently, Italian women are difficult. I have no idea. I've only ever dated a girl who was half Italian. You know what? That didn't work out so well. I don't know. Anyways... Also, having seen the movie Hostel, I'm not sure I would ever trust any situation enough to bro out to any extent that Evan does. So the dynamic duo then invite Evan to travel down the coast with them the next day, which he agrees as they literally drink the entire way down. Remember the first rule of car trips, have fun and safety third. So as it's Evan's turn to drive, Sam then talks about how he got blown off by his girlfriend and then he saw her a few years later and apparently she looked horrible. So he knows how to talk about his emotions, his words, not mine. So heading to a small Italian coastal town, everyone's just sort of vibing out as we see a woman in a red dress. Were you paying attention to Neo, or were you too busy looking at her? She then smiles at Evan as he walks with the other two men over to another hostel. So they go out drinking as Sam talks about how Americans are loud while yelling it, of course. And I break in to tell you, this beats the French by a country mile. Like, I'll vibe with the British anytime. So the woman in the red dress then approaches the bar as Evan takes notice. He then walks over to talk to her. Evan is actually pretty smooth as she tells him to leave with her, but if he likes boys more, then not to worry about it. Bro is interested as he asks, well, are you a prostitute? So he invites her out on a date to prove that she's not for a bottle of wine as she walks off saying that he made this way more complicated than it needs to be. So she notes out of there while Sam and Tom laugh as now it's the next morning. They wake up Evan saying this place is too expensive, so they're just going to head to Amsterdam. They ask if he wants to join them, but he's like, nah, I'm going to stick around this town instead. Finding a room for work, he then heads out to a farm and asks if it's still available. The farmer then asks if he's ever worked a farm before as he gets the room. Looking up, Evan then spots a picture of the farmer's wife as he says, women are the jewels of the world, except he says it in Italian, which I cannot replicate. So later, Evan then walks down an alleyway with a woman watching him, but spots the woman from earlier. Walking with her, he uses the women are the jewels of the world quote, absolute flawless victory. Of course, it doesn't immediately work, so delayed victory, I suppose. And continuing to bark up that tree, he says he will ask her out one more time, and if she's not interested, he will go somewhere else and leave her alone. She gives a vague answer, but I gotta just chalk it up to the game. Entering the museum, they then look at pottery and paintings as the woman is studying evolutionary genetics, as this town is pretty small, and the population size is also very small, and it doesn't really seem to change much, as not too many people leave, and not too many people come to this area. So seeing one of the paintings, she then asks Evan what he thinks of her, and he's like, oh yeah, she's hot. But she also has one green eye and one brown eye, which something to know, this is called complete heterochromia, and this only occurs in roughly 0.06% of the human population, which interestingly in Vienna, specifically around 25,346 people were found with this condition. There is no known health issue that accompanies it, but it does usually indicate some sort of genetic relationship between those who have it due to how actually rare it is. So heading out for a date, she then asks about his hand and he says, oh yeah, I punched a guy. Typically, brother, you want to qualify that statement like, I punched a guy at a bar versus I prevented my friend from being sucker punched with a beer bottle so I had to punch a guy. You know how those got like two totally different feels to them? So as they talk, evidently this woman has been pretty much all over the planet and Evan wants to get some wine so he writes her a letter while she finishes her espresso. Espresso at night, it's a bold strategy to never get any sleep ever. So it works though as they drink and Evan divulges his career to him is not too stellar. Grabbing the wine, they then head to the cliff's edge as she attempts to jump the railing to jump, like, fall to her death, I suppose. She then yells something in Arabic, stating names, determined personalities, which, uh, not so sure about that one. Evolutionary geneticist, right? So making some money moves, Evan then makes out with Louise. A flower in the foreground then starts blooming rapidly. Heading back to Evan's room for rent, well, I can't show you any of this either. She then throws the rain jacket away, which let me tell you something. A woman that you're meeting for the first time... You don't know anything about one another, so as your lawyer, I would advise you as taking that's a sign that something is up. That should be even more indicative that you need to wear one, but I get it. Ooga Dooga Brain takes over during events like this. 
it's kind of a blood issue with your brain fighting for its life at that point. Like, I can't blame him or anyone else. Moving on. So that morning, well, you definitely wouldn't love that face in the morning at all. She then heads back home, transformed, and then eats a cat. Dr. Mambo, no! Evan then heads into work as the farmer Angelo tells him how to put dirt around a tree. Now he just has to do that to every tree. Looking over at the farm, Evan goes and harasses a cat. Truly, that is these creatures' purpose. Bothering cats is a long-standing tradition that must be upheld. Spotting a tree with lemons and oranges, you then jump back over to Louise, putting in a brown contact to cover up her green eye. The sun then burns her hand as the cleanup crew outside bags and tags the cat. So at first, I thought maybe this was a vampire, but later we will learn this is not the case. However, we can talk about what is happening, and it will make sense in a little bit as to why this is taking place. Outlining the first issue, it appears to be a schedule with this. After sleeping with Evan, she immediately began to experience changes to her meat suit, making her more lithe and altering her appearance drastically. The burning of her hand would indicate an extreme form of albinism and no resistance to UV radiation. This is interesting as we will learn what her medication actually is later, but this is likely due to the fact that initially the pigmentation of her skin is not actually blocking the sunlight properly, leading to rapid apoptosis due to things called thymine dimers. Thymine dimers are basically when two thymine and your genetic coding are right next to each other, those will actually connect to one another rather than across to adenine. So that creates some issues because if ever your cells want to, you know, replicate your genetic coding to go through mitosis, which they tend to like to do, it will have no idea how to fix that. And it basically just creates an issue inside of your genetic coding. Anyways, it's a similar concept though as to why sunlight is both good and bad for a newborn skin. Basically, you have to have vitamin D, but at the same time, you really don't want to subject them to too much sunlight. So Evan heads back to town, clearly looking for Louise, as then he finds her at a gelato shop. I think that's how you say it. Walking in, he then cracks a joke to her, but she pretends she has no idea who he is, so he gets his fifis hurt, as she keeps asking why he's even talking to her, and she doesn't remember anything about last night. So finally she laughs though as they walk and then talk about the definition of health. Heading into a shop to grab cigarettes, she then tells him not to quit smoking on her behalf, and then heading back to Louise's place, she has bunnies in a cage that are evidently there for her experiments. Turns out Louise speaks also a ton of languages. She actually mentions a few dead ones like French, as then she goes through her music playlist. Flirting with Evan, she looks at her leg in the mirror realizing it looks like a charred piece of meat, so she quickly retreats up to the bathroom with her syringe to get the shower going as Evan looks around her apartment. She begins transforming into something with a syringe concoction preventing most of it. She then showers off as Evan says he's going to go bathe in the sea on Sunday, but she can't see him during the day as the medication she's taking makes her skin sensitive to the light. And see, that's what would be funny, like, if Evan hadn't been wearing the same thing now for presumably an entire week, this is his only outfit. And the movie will bring this up later. So waking up on the couch the next morning, he goes to use the bathroom and then finds the syringe. Top 10 memories locked in permanently there. See, I personally would have immediately begun asking questions, but somehow he just sort of ignores it for a little while. Then again, they say my timing on things is terrible. I have to agree with them. At the farm, Angelo and Evan then find fungus and bugs in the trees that they need to get rid of as Evan tells Angelo about the girl, but he found a syringe which gives him doubts about really if it's going to work or not. Angelo then just tells him, choose your poison. Angelo says Italian women are better than French women, which there's a joke here. I'm, I, I can't rag on the French that much. So Angelo then tells him to go get the fungus killer spray in the shed as Evan then finishes up the day and goes on a nice hike. Finding a dead sheep at the top of a mountain, it's pretty gross, but I have no idea what this is supposed to represent. So that night, he then meets up with Louise again, and he asks her about the syringe, as she says it's for her medical condition. And then she asks, did you think I gave you AIDS or hep C? <laughs> okay. I mean, I totally would have thought this. Then again, I'm a hypochondriac. So he pulls out his phone as he wants a picture with her, and she starts asking about his family, but he's not too receptive to it as he dodges the question. So here's the thing about dodging questions. It doesn't really work, and it's super obvious. And then if there's, like, one thing I know about women, uh, if you dodge their questions, they tend to get upset. So, I mean, I don't make the rules here. I'm just kind of living on the planet. So the picture is distorted, which is odd, as Evan says he doesn't want to talk about his family. So Louise gets up angrily and then heads over to the beach as she says he just wants to bang out a foreign girl and then show pictures to his friends. And give what we'll learn about what her intentions were earlier. I mean, I reckon it's because she likes him now, but it, hers were pretty dubious at best as well. So then he talks about it as one does. And wow, your first fight already. You guys are really speedrunning this. Evan then spills a spaghetti out of his pocket about his old man dying of a heart attack and then his mom dying of cancer last week, which is why he's even here in the first place. So she calls him an orphan farmer and how cool is it that he has the backstory of Batman. 
absolutely brutal. He then asks her about her life as she mentions her two different colored eyes. One is green and one is brown. She then lies about her ex-boyfriend making fun of her for it as she says, nah, nah, that's a lie. But I haven't lied to you, not once. Well, maybe twice, but three times, yes. But would you say four? Also yes. Surely not five though. Back on the farm, Angelo then tells Evan about the tree and how the old branches use the new trees which they will be nourished by. This entire movie is an allegory for what's actually happening with this woman, if you weren't aware. So as Louise then conducts her research, she begins changing again as her patient asks her what that smell is. Ah, so she also smells bad when she transforms, that sucks. Heading to an abandoned house, she then takes out the rabbit and then starts drawing stuff on the walls. She looks a little lithe here as she vibes in the corner for a while and then runs over to the rabbit craving its meat. Bob, no! So her skin melts away as we now head back to her apartment. Evan comes over and knocks on the door, finding that she's not feeling well. He kisses her. Great, now you're sick also, as he gets her a blanket and a pillow. Spotting the empty cage in the corner, Evan asks about what happened to the rabbits she doesn't want to talk about. Who's dodging the questions now? Evan then asks if she wants some water, but she just wants some wine. Truly, Italian. Back on the farm, Evan is released early from work for the day as he tries to hang out with Angelo, but he's too busy, so he's on his own. Heading back into town, this man has yet to change his outfit. Down on the beach, a violently patriotic American is down there, and this is false patriotism. Annoying, some would say. You can't vibe out this hard in another country. Like, don't get me wrong, they don't make them much more patriotic than me. I love this place. But if you're gonna go somewhere else, like to another country and act a fool, then don't be surprised when some 20-something-year-old Italian woman transforms into some horrific monster and eats your gear, is all I'm saying. Back at the museum, a zoom in on the green-eyed, brown-eyed woman is seen. So, tour season is officially starting. Evan got a gift for Louise, as then he signs it. It's the green-eyed woman, as Louise says they should take her boat to check out a hidden area that only the locals know about. Evan begins rowing as fast as he can, and she's like, oh, make sure you duck so we can get into the cave system. Which, quick question, uh, why do they have to duck if the light that is above their head is actually taller than them ducking? I didn't understand this part. I mean, I guess it could fold, but it never shows that. Rowing back... A basket of octopus arms is delivered to the table next to them for dinner as basically Luis appears to be inking. So uh, this appears to highlight something rather interesting as I swear the science is coming but absolutely nothing is stated until like the last 20 minutes of this movie. As we have seen, not only do plants appear to open and close in her presence but what we will see later is around here like it appears to be an influence what she transforms into at least to a degree. America Man then shows up and it's like, brother, what are you doing? He approaches her saying he's got that icky sticky back at his apartment and he doesn't speak French. So he tries to make a move on her, but uh, she is changing and he gets attacked. His body is then placed on a rock and that's it for that dude. Man, what a caricature of an American, which is gonna be somebody in the comments who's like seen Americans in movies and that's it. And they're like, oh no, that's exactly what they're like, bruv. Like, no. They're not. Anyways, with this transformation, we see specifically her skin went from the gray lithe creature we saw earlier to a more blackened and red, almost like scales. Now this could be for a multitude of reasons, but from what I can tell and what I believe it actually is happening is, it's based on what's around her that appears to activate certain genetic sequences within her DNA. This process is actually pretty in line with what we could expect to see as well. So if you aren't aware, within your genes, uh, are not so much like other animal genetics, but very similar sequences due to the fact that, according to the theory of evolution, life began as a single cell and then progressed outwards from there. And that would mean many different forms of life began and are directly related to humanity. So this life may have taken on many forms and with it the genes coded for many different body structures. Starting as aquatic, for instance, defensive body structures or offensive capabilities, different limb structures, larger teeth, fangs, potentially skin changing abilities in order to hide from ancient predators. All of these extremely old gene sequences that we don't really use anymore are reactivated, resulting in changes to the body. But then the question remains, what exactly is inspiring this? Well, we'll get there in a moment. Back on the farm, Angelo and Evan go to stare at the ocean for a while as Angelo notes, Evan's Italian is getting better. Evan says that, if Angelo ever feels up to it, he should ask out another woman, but Angelo is content to just be alone. Meanwhile, blood is smeared all over a few walls in town. Evan now shows up to give Louise some flowers as they wilt. Louise is pretty much like being ice cold as she breaks it off with Evan, only inviting him inside because the cops are approaching. Louise refuses to say what the problem is and I mean, that was a fun time in Italy. Time to jump countries, never think about this again. But then he tells her, you should probably think more about this, but she's like, nah, I'm good. So walking off, he then punches a stone wall like a 
complete idiot, then heading back to the farm, tells Angelo he's taking off. Angelo calls him stupid, as Evan then thanks him for his hospitality and says he doesn't know how much longer he's going to stay there. As Evan looks up, though, immigration has arrived. Although it's only been like a week, so I doubt it's that big of a deal, but because it is immigration, he takes off running, which doesn't look suspicious in the slightest. Back in town once more, Evan then sits at a bar as he talks about how he's lost everyone no matter where he goes, and then heading back to Louise's apartment, he's able to get the door open a little bit as he sees that she's on the ground. Breaking in, good sweet lord, what is that? He goes for the syringe but gets stabbed in the hand before injecting her in the neck, and then she goes back to normal. Well, that's probably going to be a little difficult to properly convey what's going on here. So sitting at the table, he asks if she's an alien, vampire, werewolf, or if she's human. I'd probably go with alien in this one. He then asks her to explain it as she doesn't want to, so he just kind of nopes out of there. She grabs the book and then says it was her. She posed for this picture almost 2,000 years ago. See? Alien. She begins talking about how embryonic stem cells are used to fuel her body. Basically, her body will use the cells of her pregnancy, which every 20 years she basically rebirths herself and still has all the same memories. Well, not rebirth in a traditional sense, but all the cells that she has completely change over her adult form, and then 20 years later, she just does it again. She says he wouldn't even recognize her anyway, so before she changes, though, her body begins transforming from creatures humanity was related to on the Tree of Life. She can then use the adult stem cells, but they are not as effective. She then talks about how it's not supernatural, she just doesn't understand it yet. Okay, so finally, we can talk about all the crackpot theories I have. First, this cave is not a natural formation. <laughs> that means somebody felt now. This is not supernatural, but it's clearly a genetic mutation of sorts. We can see several instances that she affects the plants around her and is also affected by the plants themselves to a degree, or at minimum, there is evidence to support this. So let's bring it back to the first flowers, right? When happy, the flowers will begin to bloom near her, and this pheromone she is producing would need to be compatible with the flower in order to do so. As a result of this, this means that the plant must also have a genetic impact on her to a degree, allowing her body to actually produce the pheromones that are compatible. This concept is later supported by the fact that when the octopus is placed next to her during her meal, she has with Evan, she will eventually, which I mean, he just busted in and saw this, she began exhibiting these traits as well. This falls in line with stem cells actually and how they function concerning their genetic receptiveness and the genetic receptiveness of her own genome to outside influences. So to set this up, we need to establish this baseline concept. At its core, right now, you can think of most of Louise's somatic cells as stem cells. So, what is a stem cell? A stem cell, both embryonic and adult, are essentially cells that have not differentiated as of yet. These stem cells hold actually a lot of promise, medically speaking, but the problem is there was this absolutely stupid smear campaign a while back, I think around 20 years ago, that suggested you could only get stem cells from fetuses, and because of this, stem cell research was dealt like a horrific blow that slowed progress in studying it. It's starting to pick back up again because people, I don't know, are less stupid, I guess is the best way to put it, or, or maybe the dinosaurs that didn't know anything about science are starting to die off, but what we do know about stem cells is it has the potential to heal a lot of basically like unhealable and crippling injuries. For instance, let's say you completely sever your spine or receive debilitating brain damage after a stroke. By utilizing stem cells, some function can be returned with the hope that as we continue to study it, all function can be regained. Stem cells work by the very fact that they are undifferentiated. By placing them near cells that are differentiated, they can become those cells because remember, neurons, epithelial, stomach cells, muscle cells, it doesn't really matter. All of your cells come from one cell. The only difference is how it differentiates. By placing them near cells that are differentiated, they become those cells. So place them near damaged neurons, for instance, that have had their connection points severed or possibly even those cells are just dead. They can functionally bridge the gap, allowing for communication once more. So you can see why this research being disrupted by a bunch of out of touch idiots in Congress, it's very annoying. And look, I could complain about this all day, but once again, politicians affecting science is one of the most irritating things imaginable. Sort of like how it was suggested the internet was a series of tubes because uh, basically somebody wanted to uh, make money off the internet. Or possibly how Guam could tip over if we put too many soldiers on it. There are a lot of stupid people in power, is all I'm saying. So I'm getting off topic. Because these cells are undifferentiated, this allows them to really become any cell that they are placed near as long as the right hormone signatures are sent guiding their change. In the case of Louise, it appears that this is what happens on a macro scale. If something is placed near her, those smells or pheromones may have the ability to change her, which can then in turn reactivate those very old genes within her, then changing her body. 
Her medication, as she puts it, is a stem cell concoction which then stops the transformation momentarily until her body uses up those stem cells. It appears though as time passes, her cells go from somatic differentiated cells to her becoming almost completely stem cell, allowing for her to take on the form of whatever is nearby, which usually turns her into a monster as opposed to a blob because she becomes a multitude of things at once as some genes are expressed in different areas versus others. So why do the new stem cells stop this mutation momentarily? Well, it's clear to a degree that stem cells are used up in the process during this transformation stage. As stated, she is currently knocked up and the gestating embryo is currently forming within her to reach a certain point. This process kicks off the changes within her body, allowing for her to become a massive stem cell. Perhaps the cells she's injecting while stem cells are human stem cells and allow her gene expression to maybe express human cells. In reality, she is becoming a giant conglomeration of stem cells once again. Adding more would seem to prevent this issue from continuing, unless maybe it's just her regular cells. So when she injects those, it allows those stem cells to kind of like stabilize the rest of her body. That's the only thing I can figure. So anyways, Evan then tells her to give him a minute as he goes and calls Tommy. He tells him that he met up with his girl and Tommy apparently just smoked a huge bowl. So the story he's telling him is apparently falling on deaf ears. Seeing Angelo standing there at Memorial, he's crying over his wife. As then heading back over to the squid monster woman, he agrees to talk about it. Touching a flower, it begins blooming. Evan then wants to stay with her before she changes into 50% him. As she says, well, I'm not in love with you. Well, that's a spirit breaker. He attempts to see if she can age with him. So, you know, maybe her meat suit can either use the embryonic cells in order to rebirth herself, or she can just use her adult stem cells, which means that, like, she'll kind of just age normally, and then will give birth to the offspring that is 50% her, 50% him, you know, like a normal event. So she's going to transform in about a day, she says, as he's like, yeah, let's take a road trip then. So as they walk, they run into immigration once again as they start their road trip. They decide to head to Naples as they talk about how actually Luis is totally loaded because it's been 2,000 years, which I mean, I would suspect you should be. Like imagine, for instance, if Dracula was broke after being alive for as long as he was. It would be ridiculous. So the cops show up as they pull over as Luis gives a thumbs up to them, allowing them to go away. This is very European. Heading over to the coast, is that the same town they just left? They did not make it very far. Talking with her, she's got her weird octopus legs in the water, and this is why, again, I also appear... It, I believe that it's what she is near that has influence as to what she becomes, because if we look around what she's around, she appears to adapt to the environment and the animals that are nearby. So in this new town, they enter a church, which Luis hasn't been to since it originally opened for the first time, like 1,500 years prior. Sitting in there, they then talk about how Louise doesn't really know anything about the afterlife, and as they continue their conversation, she begins transforming as her face looks horrific. Evan then tells her, you might want to use one of your shots and as she uses it the tentacle that was about to attack Evan gets got before it has the chance looking at a painting they then see Louise is in it as well which I, she's like in everything like how did she manage Evan does some quick math though and it's with how many men she's been with to stay alive for 2,000 years and as he starts asking who the people are in the picture to change that subject they then go check out the 2,000 year old people who are basically just mummies so now we get an explanation to how this process actually works. If her body chooses the adult stem cells, then the embryo goes to term and her body will remain as is and she will age as normal. However, if her body chooses to transform, her, basically her body will completely change. All of her original cells are changed. The embryo goes away and she is replaced by new somatic cells that are 50% her and 50% Evan, which means at that point, he probably just needs to nope out because they are officially related and that's... Not cool. So she says she has until about sunrise. Louis then says they will both die if she doesn't use those cells. I mean, he's going to die anyways because he's got a normal lifespan, but she'll die. So as they dance, though, she then stops talking and says she doesn't actually get to choose. Her body does. She thinks, though, that it has something to do with oxytocin that causes it, but that's just a theory. So what is oxytocin? It's basically what bonds our species to one another, our offspring. It even bonds us to our dogs. And our dogs actually bond to us with the same thing. I think cats probably bond as well. I mean, cats are a little more standoffish, but they probably get oxytocin. That's why they like to be around us. So basically, it's the bonding hormone is the best way to put it. But then her face almost eats Evan as she asks, do you still want this? I mean, yes, spooky, but not unsurvivable, I suppose. Besides, who doesn't want a 2,000-year-old sugar mama who's also younger? I don't know. Anyways, so it comes down to if she loves the dude or not. And she's not even sure if she does because she's never loved anyone. But they are now headed to go visit her family. Entering Pompeii, she shows them around her old town and then they go and see her family. Well, that's a downer. She evidently 
didn't get away in time, but her pain threshold was high. So with lava, she was able, she's like, I could survive lava. Which, uh, let's talk about why that's stupid real quick. See, lava wasn't the problem. It was the pyroclastic flow. The pyroclastic flow from Pompeii, or not Pompeii, but Vesuvius, I guess is the best way to put it, was so fast, I thought it moved at several hundred miles per hour, but also it flash cooked people's brains and their skull so quickly that the steam couldn't escape, so it actually broke open people's skulls. Like, it wasn't, the lava wasn't an issue. It was the superheated gas that instantly cooked everything. So I'm not really sure how she actually survived that. That doesn't make a lot of sense, but hey, don't look, just don't, don't think about it. She's 2000 years old. So her mother gave up the same gift that she had for her father, and then it was passed to her. So Evan's idea of a perfect wife gets shattered. Again, a younger woman, sugar mama, all rolled in one. She then tells Evan that her last transformation is extremely dangerous. Heading to the wall, they drink some wine, as then she starts changing. So she lays down and then tells Evan, like, oh, hey, what's it like? Tell me about the finite and being fully mortal. Well, it blows. You age, you get sick, you forget where you put the remote. Everything sucks. So as we can hear her transform, Vesuvius then outgasses as it pans out and she's completely the same. And thus concludes spring, which means, oh my god, she loves him, yay. So what exactly would be the reason that this sort of adaptation would even need to be in existence? Well, this makes you think that functionally, I mean, she is immortal as long as you take stem cells from the gestating embryo. The reason we all age is because we hit something known as the Hayflick limit. And this limit is said to be between 40 to 60 cellular divisions. Every time your cell undergoes mitosis, a little bit of your genes are damaged and the telomeres at the end, or what is affectionately known as junk DNA, is cut off. Now it should be known that this junk DNA is actually just a bunch of repeating sequences and they do have a purpose. Over time, between the natural buildup of genetic damage from like the sun, the food you eat, viruses caught, really just living in general, damage can accumulate in the body just by existing and this causes problems. Eventually the genome damage will lead to your body not being able to function properly, which means you have reached the end of your lifespan. With the adaptation Louise has, this is similar to kind of how lobsters are biologically immortal to a degree. Their genome will reset essentially after they reach a certain age. The benefits of this would allow for an individual to survive pretty much indefinitely and all but ensure their survivability of genes because rather than age out of their reproductive era and then they never get passed on, they can just reset their body back to a younger age, have the stem cells produce more eggs, and when it's a good time and they are in a safe and dual partner environment, the oxytocin allows the offspring to fully form and then they give birth. Once this process is completed, they are officially stuck in a normal lifespan, but the possibilities are really endless. This would dramatically increase the fitness of any human in any environment as it all but ensures as long as you are not taken out naturally, then your genes will get passed along. Also her, again, her surviving Vesuvius is insane, I think. But now for the bad news. Humans are not that lucky. It is said that if we were immortal, we could probably expect our luck to run out in about 600 years. Now, what is that based on? Typically just statistics about those who have ended up in a situation resulting in their end, like concerning accidents. We really are just not meant to last that long. I mean, think about how many close calls you've had, probably even as young as you are. I think back and wonder, I mean, being 32, I'm not even sure how I survived a lot of the stupid stuff that I did. But because of this, to survive for 2,000 years would be no small feat. However, genetically, due to the stem cells resetting the damage and relengthening the telomeres, this allows her to survive until her body ultimately passes along this genetic gift. Now, one of the questions I would have, would this mean that if she gets pregnant again and she's not in love, would that allow her to reset her genes? Or because she chose her adult stem cells one time and then gave birth, does that mean she's now stuck? She may never actually know because her mother got taken out by the volcano. And I guess really the only way that she would know is if she experienced it for herself, which again, kind of highlights that calamity concerning this planet and how we have to live with it. I mean, we're not invincible. And even if you have the ability to reset your genetics, it doesn't really mean you're going to live forever. But yeah, you know, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed the leave a like as always is appreciated as it gets the video out there and subscribe and let you know occasionally on when I post. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Roanoke Games, where you should definitely check that out because it's going pretty well, actually. And Roanoke Tales, which I do need to do something with that again. Ah, uh, it's just Roanoke Games kind of took precedence. Anyways, but speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, huge thank you to our astrophysicist, Death Dancer, and Feather. Thank you, guys. Next, I'd like to thank our scientists, Eris, Dakota23, Invictus Echo, Lucian Dragon, Metric System, Official Texan, the official one, and Virix Hellstrom. Thank you guys as well. And the rest of my patrons, I do appreciate y'all. Your help goes a long way towards keeping everything running and running smoothly, so it's greatly appreciated. All right, so that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and I will see y'all in the next one.